Thanks very much. Well, this is great. So, you know, part of what we wanted to talk about was just how realistic artificial intelligence and robotics and machine learning are at this point. Can you each just start by giving us a, a, a thumbnail sketch of, of the state of these industries? Oh, I don't know, Oren or Siobhan? <laughs> are we going to bring up the visual now? Is this a good time for Yeah, it? absolutely. So we, we've got, this is, uh, in part, this is a complicated chart here. This, this I think, okay, is more Okay, yes. we're done. <laughs> yeah. Complicated on purpose. This is all you need to know and seen. Um, no, so j just backing up for one minute, I mean, the, the way I kind of, you know, got into this whole ecosystem is I read Moneyball 12 or 13 years ago and kind of never recovered from that, right? And you saw this example of data and analytics transforming, you know, baseball, which of all things for analytics to transform, that was not one that you might expect. And so, you know, much of the next decade I spent, you know, looking at and building data-driven products. Uh, and then it was about three or four years ago now, and I started using these, this suite of tools to, you know, amp up my research, stay on top of my emails, glean insights from conversations and conference calls, you know, and it got to the point where I was like, you know, what's so special about this subset of tools? And I realized that all of them were using these learning algorithms. At, at this point, it was mostly natural language processing algorithms. And I realized I was like, I, don't, I can't even imagine doing my job anymore without these things. And if this is transforming my life as an individual you know, knowledge worker so much, you know, what's happening in the rest of the world? And so I started researching. Um, and so this is the second version of this, this chart. Um, the third one's actually coming out in a month. But just in doing the research and publishing this two years ago now, the first version, the, the one thing, the first thing that was just super overwhelming was there were already over a thousand companies claiming to be using these learning algorithms in, in different parts of the world. And then perhaps more interesting to me is, you know, we're in probably the first inning of a, of a nine inning game. And just look at the breadth of the application. So do, don't think about just the individual companies for a second, but if you take a look at that second row, it's every enterprise function. If you take a look at the different industries, there is no industry out there that isn't being transformed by these learning algorithms. Um, and so I was very inspired to see that, you know, it, this is already touching every piece of the world in largely positive ways. Um, and then the third bit, and the reason to do something like this is you kind of get the static snapshot of where is machine learning right now? How is it transforming the world? Um, and the biggest difference from the one we published two years ago to this chart was that top bar up there. And if you take a look, we're looking at um, these agents and these autonomous systems. And so, so what's happened is we've gotten to higher levels of autonomy. So these algorithms are able to do more complicated tasks, make these intertemporal decisions. Uh, and, and that exists both in the software world, as you can see with the agents, but then also in the, the autonomous systems of the physical world. Uh, and I'm sure you're all hit over the head you know, every day with advances in self-driving cars and things like that. So it's been kind of this wild ride. You know, we focus on future of work investing. Um, at first, we were investing in these very esoteric things, and we had maybe four or five machine learning investments. And now, you know, we rarely see an investment that doesn't have machine learning as, as a core speaker. And we've, we've invested in 35 of these companies so far. You've invested in how many companies? 35 machine learning powered companies. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we're, we're in, Siobhan says we're in the first inning of a nine inning game. Where in that first inning are we, if that, if that analogy holds? Sure. So uh, uh, Todd encouraged us to, to disagree. It always makes for a more <laughs> fun panel. But actually, Shivan is very hard to disagree with because she's incredibly uh, well-informed and, uh, and very smart. Uh, so I guess what I would say is that we're at the very beginning of that, of that first uh, inning. And I think that uh, four-year-old or so was actually right when he kind of gave his uh, intuitive assessment of when is AI coming. And the distinction that I would make is uh, between using machine learning, right, which is becoming more and more like a utility, right? Uh, Andreasen said, you know, software is eating the world, and as Siobhan is implying, machine learning is, is eating software, right? More and more, mm -hmm. um, we have the ability to identify a problem, use machine learning there. But then when you think about uh, a richer notion of, uh, of AI, where there's reasoning, there's background knowledge, you know, we don't have programs that are recommending products to us, but they're recommending to us the things that we've already just bought, right? Those sorts of uh, kind of uh, mistakes. When you think about a richer notion of AI, and that's the sort of stuff uh, we think about at the uh, Allen Institute, we are uh, quite, quite a ways off. Yeah, okay. I'm struck by uh, the idea that machine learning is eating software. Do you feel as if the traditional 
uh, the traditional concept of software development is going to become obsolete? Are all these people who are learning, learning coding going to have to find another approach to get into this big industry that's in the first inning? Well, so the analogy that I'd use is, you know, you, you had appliances, and then as soon as electricity became readily available to the world, all of those appliances somehow found a use for electric features, right? And so I'd kind of liken that here. Software development isn't going away. The whole point is there's this intelligence fabric that's popping up. And you know, as it becomes more readily available to embed in software systems, you'd be silly not to, you know, not to include that. Mm -hmm. what, what I would say is the problem with AI today, and machine learning is emblematic of that, is that you need so much natural intelligence to just ma make use of it. So yes, it's, it's everywhere, but uh, it's pretty hard to, uh, to get it to work. And of course, also, there's what I like to call the raisin bread model, right? So <laughs> machine learning is the raisins, right? And uh, without them, right, you don't have raisin bread. But if you just have raisins, then it's just raisins, it's not raisin right. bread. You need 80, 90, 95% of, of scaffolding around that. So uh, I think, uh, you know, those of you who are uh, software engineers, or those of you who have kids who will be software engineers, uh, go for it. And did the Luddites pick the raisins out of the bread? Is that how this works? <laughs> <laughs> well said. We ought to get Nathan Mervold in here to <laughs> work on the raisin bread issue. <laughs> yes, exactly. I hope you trademark that. <laughs> That's right. So uh, fundamentally what we're talking about here with machine learning, and correct me if I'm wrong, is this idea of taking in huge amounts of data, reasoning across it, having a machine and a program reason across it, and either predict something or, or do something that will be useful in other ways. Is that, is that the fundamental idea? And if so, is that artificial intelligence in and of itself? Well, first of all, we're, we're all guilty of uh, anthropomor anthropomorphizing without a license, right? So yes. it's not reasoning, right? It's doing some very uh, you know, rather uh, simple uh, computation. And again, so talking at a high level, you know, Arthur C. Clarke said uh, a sufficiently advanced technology is mm. indistinguishable from magic. And so people who don't understand the details uh, implicitly or explicitly are like, well, deep learning, machine learning, it's magic. It, a it ain't magic. Uh, out of the box, for example, typically it doesn't work. You have to do a lot of tinkering and, and labor to, to get it to work. And of course, there are companies, probably some of yours as well, but certainly in Seattle, you know, like uh, Spare 5 that works on, you know, labeling the data using crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. uh, Dato Turi, which was acquired by Apple on, you know, platforms for it, you know, context relevant to, you know, bringing that to the financial sector and otherwise. So there wouldn't be so many machine learning companies if it was easy as, you know, as easy as, you know, jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> what am I saying? That, that was people cute. sometimes call us crazy, but as compared to the prior <laughs> yeah, exactly. speaker, I was like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm vanilla. <laughs> so what's your favorite real world example, something that exists today of machine learning that's actually, actually helping somebody or helping a company? I mean, I can talk all day if, if you want. Yeah. So, well, why don't, let's pick a homegrown example. So we're, our fund is based in San Francisco and New York, but the one thing you know, that continuously pops up is there are a whole bunch of these other fantastic hubs developing machine learning-based technologies. And so we'll bring up an example, which is a Seattle-based company called Textio. Um, has anyone heard of Textio? And so the, the way to think about them in its most fundamental terms, they're, they're a text editing platform. But in the same way that you wouldn't send out an email without using spell check today, in the future, you, you will have you know, these much richer engines that can tell you for any specific type of text and where you're going to place it, here are the things you need to be cognizant of. And so super practically, how many of you have had to write a job description ever? Keep your hand up if you think you're really good at writing a job description. Mm -hmm. I, you can't see, they're like three hands still up, right? <laughs> but there are these types of expertise that you know, we have to do a whole bunch of different things every day, um, and it's just not worth our time because we're not specialized in that task to become an expert in it. And so, you know, what Textio said is, you know, they want to do this spell check 2.0, this like text editing platform as a general wave. But the first thing they took was this job description piece. And, um, you know, if you think about why this is, you know, an, an interesting and sort of quint quintessential example of the, the things that we like to invest in, they found a real problem, which is expertise being left on the floor. You know, and recruiting and time to fill positions with good candidates is, is a big issue. Uh, and, you know, basically what they did is when you think about a machine learning company, 
there's the data strategy, there's the algorithm layer, and then there's sort of the end user interface and, and the problem that you're actually solving. And they were brilliant on the bottom and the top. And the algorithmic layer actually for us, I'd be curious to hear what you, know, you think, Oren. You know, we're not necessarily saying you gotta use deep learning and these complex things for every, for every problem. We're looking at people who are practically solving a solution, right? And so what they did is they went to Fortune 500 companies and said, give us all of your job descriptions and let's basically cross-correlate that with time to fill the position, how amazing that candidate was, and even things like what were the, you know, what were the demographics of that candidate, uh, and then they embed that into a word interface. So you don't have to be a technical user to use this. Anyone can just look into the tool, and you put your job description in, and it will tell you how well it pr thinks your job description is going to do, and that will highlight individual words and phrases and educate you in real time about how you can make your job description better. And so we love when machine learning companies are able to provide expertise while taking complexity out of it. There's no technical jargon in here. Yeah. Do you have a favorite, Warren? Oh, sure. Uh, again, I'll, I'll just pick one. But uh, certainly, Texio is a great example. And you see why you want Siobhan as an investor, right? She's uh, <laughs> telling you their, uh, their story. Self-driving cars, right, uh, is something that's coming. We uh, see it already partway there in safety systems in the Tesla and other places. Those are all based on uh, millions and tel tens of millions of uh, miles driven by cars, right? So these are machine learning systems, uh, even when they don't have the full capability, just staying on the road or keeping the right distance from the car ahead of you, that's, that's a uh, machine learning problem uh, par excellence. So uh, that's probably my favorite example right now. Yeah. One of the things that I'm really curious about is uh, if we're in the first inning, there's probably going to be an increased diversity of uh, tools and companies and everything, but uh, do you see a time when there will be consolidation? Is there going to be a bot OS, uh, someone who will be setting the standard? Is there going to be one bot to rule them all uh, down the line, or do you see this as moving out like an evolutionary tree and, and uh, diversifying and it, you know, the rest are just gonna die out. We might be able to disagree on this, who knows? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say uh, real quick is, it's still obviously very much in the early days, right? That's, that's a common theme, but if you take bots uh, in particular, with it, it's a topic that's of, of great interest to people. Uh, I think we're particularly in the early days, despite the mm -hmm. fact that now every company has a, an entry. The bots are very uh, primitive. Uh, l l let me give an example. Uh, who knows how many skills, quote unquote, uh, Amazon Alexa has, the Amazon Echo? I do, but I'll be quiet, Warren. <laughs> how, ma how many people think it has more than 100 skills? How many people think it has more than 1,000 skills? Okay, so it has more than 1,000. How many of them, right, do people use every day? Probably not more, th uh, or even in a week. But yeah, no more Three. than five and seven. And I've got a six-year-old who's a very active, uh, you know, uh, Alexa user, but he asks her uh, to sing happy birthday and to tell him what the weather <laughs> is because I try to get him to put on a jacket in the, in the Seattle fall, right? And this is his source of data. He's a database kid. Anyway, the, the, the point is uh, <laughs> these skills are not discoverable in, in any easy way, and it becomes not a skill Mm -hmm. platform. Another problem is you can't have a dialogue with it, right? You can get it to launch Spotify, that's great, but it's still in very, very early days. And it's not like Alexa is primitive. Alexa is at the cutting edge. It's mm -hmm. not like you can have a uh, satisfactory dialogue with Siri or Google's thing or, or anything. So, so the answer is, to me is, again, I, not my phrase, but 10 seconds from the Big Bang, the galaxies are expanding, which of course is great for all of us. There's a ton of opportunities here. Uh, consolidation comes, but long time Way from now. further, yeah. Um, well, you actually, you pointed out something really interesting, and, and I think people conflate two things when they think about these bots or these agents or whatever you want to call them. There's the actual natural language interface, so a thing I can talk to, whether it's in text or with my voice, and what's actually happening behind the scene. So what new tasks can it do? What data does it have access to? What transactions can it actually complete? Um, and, you know, a handful of the bots we're seeing these days are just slapping a natural language interface onto an existing system. And the thing we're more excited about is that second category, which is, again, what skills you know, can, you, can you put into the system? Um, and you make a good point that Alexa skills are largely untapped and unused, right? And this is one of the reasons why I don't think you're going to see 
extreme consolidation in the space. And the way I look at this, and again, we've got the world of work professional lens on things, is I have my CEO hypothesis, which is take some Fortune 500 CEO, let's you know, take Ginny Rometty, for example, and you know, Ginny's got a, a suite of support staff that does different sort of atomized tasks. So you have your analysts that are constantly looking at information, keeping you up to date. You have sort of a copywriter speech editor. You're going to have a handler. You're going to have a scheduler. You might have a driver, a personal shopper. And there are these, all these different kinds of supporting expertise. Hmm. And so my best guess is, and you know, we, we've made investments in three of these different categories we've identified, and, and hopefully we'll do more. But because these different, you know, these different types of support staff need access to different kinds of information, and the task they're completing at the end of the day is generally very, very different, I think different companies will win in different silos. Mm -hmm. And that will be mm -hmm. divided amongst the big players like the Facebooks and the Amazons and startups that are entering. So it's not a model where you have one dominant player, for example, Microsoft with Windows, and then you have all these applications that are built on that platform. You don't see a common platform emerging that someone is in control of I and that I can buy not stock in? in the in? next five years, and if we get there, it's actually kind of scary because that means that one entity has access to all of your data, and one of our biggest privacy protections as consumers is the fact that this stuff is still very siloed out. Mm -hmm. So with smartphones, we saw a lot of the like Siri and uh, Cortana initially, really used that as the interface. We saw them use smartphones. And then we've seen Amazon come along with Alexa and define the new sort of voice paradigm. And then I, I saw a talk from Ray Kurzweil a while back. He takes, takes us like 30 years out, and he's talking about nanobots and the neocortex, mm -hmm. right, actually embedding it. I'm curious, is there or, or are there logical steps between that voice interface and actually uh, the, the stuff the brain that actually bot. gets yeah, the brain bot. I mean, is, is, is the voice interface the, the place where we're going to be for the time being in terms of the interaction with these technologies? The, the first thing I would say is I really like to separate science from science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody call Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> yeah, Ray, Ray Kurzweil is in the, in the far end of science, of science fiction. fiction, right? There, there's not th no data to back up the things he he talks about, uh, but there's great stories, uh, you know, by science fiction writers. So, uh, as as far as the science goes, uh, the thing that I see is first of all, things always expand, right? We still use that thing called radio, right? So uh, I don't think anything takes over. I do think that there are places where it's really natural to have a voice interface, and that's uh, in the car. Um, mm. Turns out brilliantly, it's uh, it's in the kitchen. There's still going to be pl plenty of places where we use our phone or even that you know desktop uh, computer. Everybody here has a laptop, right? It's not uh, practical, right, to do what you're doing uh, via talking, right? So uh, I think it's it's an expanding universe. And the thing that's amazing to me is you know uh, I was visiting my dad in D.C. the other day, and he's still futzing with three remotes, right? <laughs> futzing is a technical term. Uh, yeah. And it's crazy, right? Why can't he just talk to the thing and say, hey, you know, uh, put on Netflix, uh, right? Uh, how many if people here? If you do a startup, you have to call it futz, the next one that deals with that complexity. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Later, please. yeah, so, okay, so, that, so uh, obviously voice is, is going to be here for a while, but, but smartphones won't go away. No, they won't. And and uh, and and Siobhan is right. There's there's challenges at all levels. The challenge that we've all, all but solved is certainly the voice one, the speech recognition. But the actual understanding uh, is super limited. The dialogue has these two pieces: a understanding, you know, if I say it in the next sentence, what it is referring mm -hmm. to. But then uh, underneath the covers, for example, there's all these skills. What about putting you know three skills together so you don't end up in launching an app? You actually end up uh, you know, getting something done. Uh, we, we don't even know how to do how to do that. So, huge room for uh, innovation. So, if you're a business owner or a CEO or a startup leader in the audience, and you're working in a field that is not directly artificial intelligence, at what point do you say, okay, I need a bot. I need a chat bot. I need some kind of Alexa skill. What is the threshold that makes you start experimenting this with this before there's actual customer value? I think you first ask why, right? There's, they're slapping a natural language interface on things because you can. 
Um, I, I think one of the things that's yet to be determined in the ecosystem is it, it will be this great lead gen channel eventually, right? So if you provide some sort of product, you're absolutely going to have to have an integration into Facebook M or Alexa because that's, you know, that entity is going to have a lot of purchasing power in the future. Um, but in terms of creating a voice interface to deal directly with your customer, in some cases it makes sense. You know, to your point about an automotive, I think all of the automotives are going to have to figure out how people interact with the car when they're driving, and that's going to be the way to do it. Um, but you can actually do damage to yourself as a business by doing this badly, and the reasons are, you know, maybe not entirely obvious. So every business created a smartphone app as soon as you know iOS and Android existed. And the app would just kind of sit silently in the phone. And if you created a bad app, maybe people would delete it. They wouldn't use it. The scary thing about these chatbots and this phenomenon is they feel relatively human, and they pester you. So I don't know how many of you have downloaded bots into your Slack or whatever else to try them out. They can really piss you off, and they can cause you know, <laughs> <laughs> negative brand value. So uh, you know, the fundamental question is you know, think very deeply about the interaction paradigm and what you can actually offer customers on top of everything else versus having the bot that just constantly pings you like a bad spam email. You're on, you're on board with that, yeah. Oh, yeah. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and beware Clippy, right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Beware <laughs> Clippy, yes, Good indeed. Point. Uh, what about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to say you you've mentioned uh, the concern about privacy mm -hmm. and and trust and uh, as we move into this age, uh, I think that the trend is going to be the AI assistant knows more about you and and can anticipate your every need or anticipate what you might want to buy. It mm -hmm. seems like the stakes are pretty high for for uh, for privacy concerns and also. Uh, just being able not to be pestered by an ad bot uh, as you get to know your favorite bot down the line. I think consumers are going to have a fairly binary response to a lot of this technology. And in the same way, you know, say you got a new colleague that's looking over your shoulder at your right. emails and they're not adding value, you're going to be like, get the heck out of here. Whereas if, if it's your assistant and you grant them access to your inbox because they're actually doing things that are helpful to your right. life, mm -hmm. it's surprising how much we're willing to give up privacy when there's a significant benefit. And you're right? developing a trust relationship exactly. with uh, you know, a machine, basically. Well, the, it's an upside downside thing. So think about, for example, med medical data, what exists in your electronic medical record. There are two ways to think about that data. One way is you can it can be used to discriminate against people who have prior existing conditions or you know, are high risks, or it can be used to do preventative care. So you know, a lot of this ends up going on the people who are developing this, these systems. It's like develop it with the consumer upside in mind, not necessarily the discrimination function, right? Um, and we're going to, as society, have to expect companies to abide by that. Mm -hmm. I feel really good to be at the uh, Allen Institute where, you know, Paul Allen's vision, thank <laughs> you, is, is, is about science. And uh, so the data that we consume exclusively is uh, scientific data, textual data. We don't consume any data that's private uh, uh, of any kind. And uh, again, uh, I'm not opposed to capitalism, people making a buck, but uh, it's nice to, uh, to, to do something else. And, and we have to remember, right, the line, if the product is free, right, and all these products mm -hmm. that we use, you know, Google search, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, if the product is free, you're, you're the product. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, again, to, to be a little bit controversial, because we're among friends, it's not like I'm being filmed or something. Um, <laughs> th th I think there is no privacy. I think that there are two kinds of people, the kind of people who have given up and the kind of people who are deluding themselves, right? When you have Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> have to take a piece of sticky tape, Mark Zuckerberg, right, who has access to the, you know, some of the best IT teams in, in the world, he has to take a piece of sti uh, sticky tape and put it over the camera in his laptop, that tells you <laughs> that you have no privacy, right? Because he's worried about it. He's using a, a duct tape solution to his privacy problem, right? So <laughs> something, something to contemplate. So even in the age of AI, duct tape still fixes everything. That's, that's the good news, <laughs> right? That's going to be really hard for a lot of people to swallow. Will it basically, is there the potential or the risk of keeping us back from artificial intelligence advances if that's the reality. That's, that's tough. I got to see Oren talk last week, and, and you brought up a very interesting um, idea, which is that AI research in some ways is, is not, a, not a thing we should be scared of, but in, 
a moral imperative. And, and the point you were making is there are so many lives that are lost today, whether it's auto accidents or medical errors or whatever else. Like, we kind of have to invest in these systems in some sense. And I do think, you know, there's, again, huge upside and downside potential, but, you know, focusing on the good elements of it and as a society just really expecting, you know, that there, there be those blinders on the side to not delve into the more negative parts of the ecosystem is going to be critical. So we're, we're all involved in this. I told you Shivan is incredibly well informed. <laughs> I, I, I just I follow do. him around and just hope little nuggets of wisdom fall out. <laughs> I, I do, I, I do uh, very much agree with myself, but it's really uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Moshe, Moshe Vardy, a computer scientist, who said, we have a moral imperative to, to study AI because of the potential to save lives. And the easiest way to see it is with the cars, right? Reducing accidents and also preventing medical errors. And you know that's something that we're working on. We have a scientific search engine called Semantic Scholar. So there is uh, this privacy issue, and it, it's a real issue. I'm not sure if it's an AI issue, right? It's a it's a data gather, gathering issue. But uh, there's huge potential societal benefits for for AI. Yep. So. You both have a different view into the startup world. Oren, you've started several startups, many startups, and Siobhan, you obviously look for startups to invest in. If you were looking at the landscape, what are the holes out there? Like, If you were going to be starting a, a machine learning or artificial intelligence startup right now, what are the opportunities if somebody wants to go out there and do something that you'd invest in or that you might incorporate into your research, Oren? I'm kind of obsessed with one area right now, and we made our um, I apologize, I'm a seed investor. We do this annoying thing where we say, I invested in stealth company. Um, but that's just the reality uh, sometimes. So we wired on our first investment in this category that I'm really excited about. But I think there's a huge role that machine intelligence ought to play in assisting the elderly. And the reasons for that and, and why I'm so personally motivated to find more things or incubate more things uh, is, you know, you've got what they're calling the silver tsunami. So it's the demographic trends that are going to, you know, you're just going to have the elderly population be a much more significant part of the population. You have socioeconomic trends that mean that there's a little bit more income disparity. So what's happening at the, at the lower rungs is getting concerning in terms of medical care. And then you're kind of seeing this more globally distributed population and the, you know, the dissolving of the nuclear family to some degree. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm never going to be one to argue that anything can replace sort of the human touch, right? But there are going to be gaps in care. And one of the less obvious pieces of this that I'm curious to see machine intelligence tackle is sort of that companionship and loneliness right. side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and to think about AIs and empathetic technology is very curious, but uh, you know, Microsoft had deployed this bot called Xiaowice uh, in China via the WeChat platform. And the super surprising thing was, you know, adolescents were interacting with this bot and they were getting a ton of emotional support out of it, right? Which you could argue is a good and a bad thing, but that just like turned my mind onto the idea that it can actually make a difference from a social and emotional and, and, and connection perspective, right? And so we hope to see more and more in that category. Uh, and then the other place we are really looking is uh, data science has moved away from being sort of this lone wolf, like looking into the data of an organization to really becoming a team sport. And so we've invested in a couple of companies. So Domino Data Labs and Kaggle are doing a good job here. But there are more, there are more and more technologies that are making, you know, getting really unique access to data much more accessible. And we're going to continue to invest in that. Yeah. yeah what, what startup opportunities out there? What, what would you recommend? Well, uh, you know, people do ask me from time to time, right? What sector are you excited about? You know, healthcare or. or you know, AI hardware, there, there's so much. And, and I, I've thought about this, and I guess I feel like, you know, sometimes somebody asking you what's the hottest sector is a little bit like somebody saying to you, hey, you know, you should really marry this person. You're both interested in, in urban horticulture. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not a reason to marry a person, the fact that you're both interested in urban horticulture. And I look less at sector and more at other dynamics like, who are the people you're going to be working with, you know, 24-7? What's your technology edge? I always like to start uh, a company or to see companies that start from a significant technology advantage, not what's sometimes called an execution play, right, mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. uh, you, you live or die on, on that. So uh, I, I think less about, uh, about the area and more about just what, what, what's the style of it? What, is it? what does it feel like? You know, is there you know, urgent problem? All, 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 the, all that sort of thing. That, 
Oh, sorry, I was gonna get as close as I can to disagreeing with you, it's really, really, really hard, but um, I, I, would, I would add one thing, which is, um, you know, when we make investments, we separate them into two categories. There's the pioneers, so I've like really created this new algorithm that can do this crazy thing no one ever did before. And the other side of that is, I think about 80% of our investments are in smart integrators, and the, I, the one thing I just wanted to impress is we have never been closer to a free lunch as exists right now, because you have Google, Amazon, Microsoft open sourcing a lot of the research they're doing, open AI, a lot of the work you guys are doing. Basically, the, you know, all the building blocks and components are there for somebody who wants to take these technologies to an industry that perhaps wasn't very data-driven or machine learning oriented before. So I completely agree with you that, that new tech and tech advantage is important, but there's also this other big world too, so. Mm. I tried to disagree with them, but I really like yeah, him. No, that's true, that's true. <laughs> so you both obviously seem optimistic about the future of AI, and Siobhan, I was listening to one of your videos and you said, I'll admit I haven't said I love you to a bot yet, but I'm excited for the day when I can. Is that, is that true? I, are you going to regret saying that? A little bit. I could make San Francisco jokes and half the people being kind of like bots, but well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and Oren, you've, we've talked in the past about this idea of an AI utopia, which in, in both of these views are very different in contrast yeah. with the sometimes negative view of, of where this is headed. Why, why are you both so optimistic? I'm optimistic about uh, about the potential benefit, right? And uh, and I, despite being an optimist, uh, th there are issues. But so jobs is a huge one. So I, I'm definitely worried, and I think everybody should be thinking and discussing and worrying about uh, the impact uh, on jobs, right? And particularly people uh, who aren't right the the AI expert. What does this mean to them? You know, uh, right. you mentioned uh, Moshe Vardy. I think that he's talked about how. 50% of the world might be non-employed uh, by 2050, and a lot of them will be in the transportation business because of self-driving cars. Right, so yeah, I don't know if those numbers are exactly right, but certainly he says that, and, and that's definitely something to think about. You know, six to 10% of the workforce is in the transportation sector in the US today. The, the thing I wanna point out though, and this is related to Siobhan's point about demographics, is there's two sides to every coin, right? So when you automate something, you also drive the cost down. When you mm -hmm. automate something, you mean there's a set of things we can't afford in an aging society to have uh, a human caregiver for every one of us as we age. It's, uh, you know, if, if we could, it would be wonderful. We can't. So now the question is, do you have people in rural areas and other places who are sitting there pretty lonely? My 17-year-old was delivering food to a lot of people like that in the Seattle charity this summer. They don't get a lot of interaction. Now, relative to zero, this uh, a bot type of interaction that you know, Siobhan is experiencing in San Francisco, uh, that she was talking about in terms of the other, starts to look better and better, right? So uh, I, I just saying uh, there are some things to be concerned about, but there are two sides to, to every coin there. Yeah, why are you optimistic? Well, so I think on the one hand, um, you can't play defense against technology in any sector. It's just not going to happen. And so I think, uh, you know, what we have, and there are going to be upsides and downsides to every single technology type. Um, in this case, I think the applications for good are just so overwhelming. I mean, just take a look at, you know, a subset of our investments and other people's investments. We're getting, you know, more crop yields out of every drop of water. We're pre preventing catastrophic loss from, you know, pests in various areas of fields that you wouldn't have seen before. So, you know, we're literally feeding more of the population with fewer resources, right? Um, I don't know if any Anyone's read Diamond Age, you know, Neil Stevenson, mm -hmm. but the idea that we could de democratize something like educational materials in a very personalized way, again, getting to the retraining of the population to use them, there's a lot of promise in these technologies, and the democratizing factor of them is just, you know, more people can get assistance more cheaply, and, and that's, you know, that's, I think, a really important thing that we all need to work on. Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, local author. Uh, which brings me to the last question that I wanted to really <laughs> ask is uh, we've had so many tales about AI. You've got Ex Machina and Her and Morgan recently came out. Do you have a favorite uh, AI movie or story either because it really gets it or because it's just hilarious? So I did say I loved you, you to a bot once, but that was just to test it. I didn't really love the bot, so I was being a liar. Um, but to that point, um, her, I think, did a really good job. I mean, there were dystopian elements to it, but I think it did a really good job of 
showing us that transition to, you know, away from real world interactions to the fact that we're going to have to, you know, battle with sometimes it being more comfortable to only just be in our own heads and to deal with computing systems. You know, we're seeing the same thing in video games right now, what happens when that gets more real. Um, and I think her did a really good job of transposing that over society in general. Mm -hmm. I'm really tired of the AI being cast as the bad guy, whether it's Terminator or Terminator 2 or 3, or being cast as the bad girl in Ex, Ex Machina. So I would say my favorite AI movie is To Come, where somebody writes an innovative script where AI is the good, uh, is the protagonist. Uh, it's a tougher plot line, but talk to me. We can, we can work on it. So this. someone in this audience has to... It may be written by an AI. <laughs> That's great. <weird. laughs> All right, well. Someone in the audience has to do the Neil Stevenson movie, and then we'll all be good, because we'll have, we'll have the positive spin. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you both very much for being here. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank you.